Okay, so I think we're going to go ahead and begin. Um, thank you everybody for joining us in the, the sixth in the series of events under Consider It Done, uh, IPM's initiative to bring you the latest in uh, information, education, and technology news around uh, data center, uh, virtual infrastructure, and everything you, that you need to know that implies around that. Um, Today, uh, we have a special guest, uh, Doug Lane, Director of Product Marketing from AppSense. He's going to be talking about the top seven secrets to accelerating your migration from Windows XP uh, to Windows 7, a uh, super important topic as everybody considers that migration. Um, <clears throat> uh, my name is Tim Freestone. Uh, many of you may know me by now. Uh, a couple of quick logistics. Um, as always, there's a chat window um, on the lower left of your screen. So please go ahead and use that to uh, chat amongst yourselves, pose questions, comments, uh, however you feel um, to use it. And at the end, we'll go ahead and uh, I'll pose those questions uh, to Doug, um, uh, like I said, right at the end of the presentation. Um, I will uh, go ahead and introduce uh, Shannon Hazen now with, with IPM. I'll give you a little bit on, on the Consider It Done initiative and then uh, hand it off to Doug and, and uh, we'll be on our way. Thanks again. Great. Thank you, Tim. Uh, I'd like to say thank you to all, those of you that have been with us through this entire series. This is the sixth event of a sixth series um, on Consider It Done, which is the IPM initiative that we designed to provide all of our attendees with the opportunity to learn about key considerations for current and future IT projects, and to introduce those of you that aren't familiar with IPM as hopefully your go-to partner for project execution. So with that, I will go ahead and pass it along to Doug Lane, Director of Product Marketing at AppSense, who we will be discussing the top seven secrets to accelerating your migration from Windows XP to Windows 7. Doug? Great, thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today, and thanks to, to IPM for, for having me on today. Um, as, as we mentioned today, the topic is really thinking about Windows 7 migration and some ways that you can accelerate uh, your migration from the traditional Windows XP desktop to your Windows 7 environment of the future. Uh, once again, my name is Doug Lane. I'm with AppSense, and uh, we work closely with IPM around this particular topic as well as others. And what we were hoping to accomplish today was a few things. First and foremost, I'll, I'll share with you a little bit of background in terms of Windows 7 and some of the trends that, uh, that we're seeing, and, and likely you are as well. Um, before jumping in too deep, I'll talk a little bit about some of the things we're seeing with our customers around kind of pitfalls or risk areas to avoid uh, or consider when you're approaching your Windows 7 migration. From there, we're going to jump into seven key secrets we found that can really help go a long way towards accelerating and taking risk out of your Windows 7 migration project. And then to close, I'll talk a little bit about some of the cost uh, implications to all this, in particular kind of highlight some data from, from Gartner and, and kind of what we've seen in relation to that. And as Tim mentioned, we'll do some time at the end for, for Q&A as well, so feel free to uh, um, come up with some questions along the way. I'd be happy to, to answer those. So just to start off, a little bit of, um, of information about Windows 7. I'm sure it's, it's top of mind for, for many of you these days, and um, you're not alone in that. While in most cases, in, or in many cases, organizations have kind of skipped Windows Vista and, and are remaining on Windows XP today, um, in many ways, you know, regardless to that, it really is increasing the... Um, the importance and the adoption rate of, of Windows 7 because there is a very you know kind of finite window um, that remains to get off of Windows XP as I'll touch on in a moment. But um, you know, in addition to that, uh, it's actually a pretty good operating system. I think many people are, are moving to it and finding benefits uh, beyond Windows XP. In addition to kind of modernization, there's a lot of um, uh, new capabilities and improvements on kind of traditional Windows paradigms that are are there for the taking. So those those factors are really coming together to a point where uh, many organizations already are working on a Windows 7 migration in some fashion, and um, the analyst firm IDC is, is estimating about 90% of organizations have some type of migration um, in progress at this point, and the, the Windows um, uh, Microsoft licensing adoption numbers are kind of uh, corroborating that in terms of the number of, of, of folks that are uptaking on those licenses. And um, it's really no surprise in that, you know, part, partly what Microsoft has done here is they've you know, put a line in the sand for April 2014 as the end of support date for Windows XP. So even for organizations that feel as though Windows XP is kind of meeting their needs and if it's not broken, don't fix it, there is this kind of um, compelling event coming around Windows XP and the support that is going to require a move to Windows 7 uh, so as to avoid not having your, your core operating system go out of support from, from Microsoft. 
So um, with that as a backdrop, um, we are seeing this migration happen. This is some additional data that um, I was able to get from Gartner that really just shows the transition of organizations moving off of Windows XP and onto Windows 7. And what you can see here is that um, it certainly started, but it's really just you know, still kind of early days in terms of moving uh, over to Windows 7. And I think what you'll see over time is that there'll be a, a, a large rush um, as that end of, end of support date approaches, which you can kind of see reflected in the diagram here. There will be some, some laggers that are kind of still working on this after that date, but I think for the most part that, um, that, that April 2014 date is a key one in the minds of a lot of corporate IT uh, teams as they really look to, uh, to get all of this aligned around that, uh, that time frame. And obviously to hit that time frame, it requires starting um, you know, now or soon in order to make sure you can do it without disrupting your, um, your end users in your, in your corporate environment. And that's really what today's discussion is all about. So um, with that in mind, a couple of key you know, pitfalls we've seen organizations uh, step into that, um, you know, or, or I guess areas to, to consider are things like hardware compatibility and whether the particular hardware that you have in place today is capable of supporting Windows 7, does it have the necessary um, RAM processing power, um, is there driver compatibility for all the components within the hardware, and if not, is this aligned, your, is your migration project aligned with your PC refresh project to the point where that risk um, can be mitigated. Um, probably a bigger one and a bigger area of, of, um, of focus and concern is around application compatibility. Um, obviously the business applications your organization is running are, are kind of the lifeblood of your computing environment. Um, that the reason the whole operating system is, is there to begin with. So um, you know, key considerations are things like you know, will the application run with Windows 7? Um, are you moving to perhaps 64-bit computing? And if so, does that raise uh, concerns uh, with application compatibility? Um, and also, as we'll talk about, you know, are there ways that you could potentially improve the way that you deliver applications um, as part of that migration? So, this, you know, part of it is getting there, but part of it is, you know, trying to create a better um, management environment for yourself as you move to this new operating system uh, uh, scenario. Um, and then finally, thinking about the impact of the project to your constituents, whether it's the folks within your IT staff or whether it's the end users that are out there computing every day, um, obviously, these are all folks that are very busy on a day-to-day -day basis, and you need to really consider um, the impact that this project will have and look for any opportunity to both reduce the resource impact to your IT team, but also um, reduce or, or even eliminate the disruption that may occur to the end users that are ultimately your, your internal customers. So um, you know, hopefully, you know, some, somewhat obvious items, but just a few things that, I, that I'd like to point out to, to set the stage. With that, what I'm going to shift gears and do is talk about um, our seven secrets for success with moving from XP to Windows 7. So these are a, a, a few things that um, really encompass a couple different areas, one being areas where you can accelerate the Windows 7 migration itself, but also areas where, as part of that migration process, you can take some proactive steps that will make your life better from a management security standpoint after you make the move, as well as even potentially plant the seed that's going to make life easier when um, heavens forbid you have the next task of moving to Windows 8, which uh, obviously Microsoft is already out there talking about, even as many organizations are still um, trying to get to 7. So that's really the goal here, and with that, I'll, uh, I'll jump into some of these. So the first secret that we've identified is really focusing on the user and, and looking at ways to decouple the user from the underlying operating system. Um, in the past, and particularly in, in a lot of Windows XP environments, the desktop is really kind of a tangled up collection of operating system data, application data, and then user data is really intertwined with all of this to the point where even if you're starting with a very standardized Windows image, it's very difficult to support and, and move users around because of the fact that, that that user data is so intertwined with everything. So what we um, are generally working with organizations to do is, is think about managing the user separately as you, you know, before and, and to facilitate that move to Windows 7. So is there a way that you could decouple that user layer um, from the underlying operating system and applications, manage it centrally, and then be able to deliver a personalized experience that is OS independent and is also, as we'll cover, platform independent. So if you start to introduce new things like desktop virtualization, you have the portability of the users to move across those different environments. And uh, there's a technique that, that we advocate at AppSense called user virtualization that, um, that accomplishes that. Um, I think most often people are are familiar with the core OS virtualization and application virtualization, but by decoupling this user layer, things like Windows 7 migration, even if you're not moving to a virtualized environment, become much easier. Um, in effect, what you can do 
is get in the business of enabling new operating systems rather than migrating. So instead of having a one-way street where you're trying to suck user settings out of XP and then inject them into Windows 7, instead, but through the ability to deliver a user persona on demand to any desktop, you can simply turn on new Windows 7 desktops and a user will experience that same personalized um, desktop environment that they left behind in XP the first time they log into Windows 7 without having to do a time-consuming migration project. And another key element of this type of approach of being able to manage the user centrally and deliver that experience on demand is that it gives you two-way roaming capabilities. So um, most organizations don't have the intent of really going backwards to Windows XP. However, if you have the option of doing that, a lot of those risk areas I highlighted, you can mitigate a bit because you can move very aggressively to move your users to Windows 7. If you have the odd user who runs into issues, you can very easily roll them back to Windows XP. And the same notion applies with respect to Windows 8 in that you can have users who are um, potentially now decoupled from that underlying OS. And as a result, when you start to introduce new operating systems like Windows 8, you're not back in the same boat you are today in terms of having a big migration project in front of you. Instead, you have this flexible IT fabric that's capable of supporting a multi-OS environment without detracting from that user experience. So um, it kind of goes part and parcel with, with secret number two, which is to come up with a new optimized desktop experience that is not only OS independent, but is independent of the deployment approach that you're using. So many of you are probably thinking about um, moving from native Windows XP PCs to native Windows 7 PCs, and, and that will help um, in terms of decoupling the user. But oftentimes what organizations are also doing is thinking about, okay, I already need to make a big change to my desktop why don't I think about new techniques like desktop virtualization, maybe working with Citrix or VMware or somebody to, to do that. And um, that same notion of, of decoupling the user and being able to deliver personalization on demand allows users to roam between native PCs and virtual desktops. So whether you're just moving them to a virtual desktop as part of the migration, um, that same notion of them being able to log in and experience exactly what they did from a customization standpoint in XP still applies. Um, and then also there are some, some additional benefits in that by decoupling the user, you're able to deploy kind of a generic non-persistent pool of um, VDI images so that you can reduce your storage costs. So rather than giving each user their own customized um, virtual desktop, instead you have this generic pool of non-persistent images which are easier to support and, and consume less storage in your data center environment. At the same time, whenever a user accesses one of those generic um, VDI images, the experience they see is one that's very personalized and very consistent with their PC environment, either that they're still using today or that they've used in the past. So this can, can really strike a great balance. Um, and whether you're planning to uh, deploy virtual desktops right away as part of your Windows 7 project or you're just trying to get to Windows 7 on PCs but have thoughts of adding virtualization later, either way this idea of managing the user separately is going to, to help you. So um, the, the next uh, item I'll mention, secret number three, is thinking about the increasingly mobile workforce and the fact that your users will likely be logging in to your corporate resources from different devices. And this could be a scenario like I just described where they're using a, a, a native PC in conjunction with a virtual desktop, or it could be a case where they are utilizing a, um, an iPad and potentially trying to remotely connect to a Citrix infrastructure in addition to their PC. Um, or a variety of different circumstances that can come up. And the idea with this is to really think about, um, you know, kind of context-aware computing, the same ability to apply, um, you know, kind of customization of the environment on demand in that you may have users that, um, you know, in some circumstances are on an iPad in an untrusted uh, wireless network at Starbucks. You may have a user that's on that same iPad on the trusted corporate network, and then you may have a user who's sitting on a desktop PC tethered to the corporate network that same user could be accessing the same resources and based on where they're coming from, you may want to have different types of, um, you know, kind of security policies as well as configuration of the desktop. And um, that kind of brings us to, to number four, which goes kind of part and parcel to this, is making that desktop adaptive based on the context of the user. So you not only want them, if they log into, say, a Citrix session from their iPad to experience the same application environment in something like Excel, for example, as they did if they were running that application locally on their laptop, you want to make that personalization apply, but also you want the, the desktop environment to adapt. So if they're on a 
uh, a Citrix session on their iPad at Starbucks, maybe they have one set of things they can do from both a security and policy standpoint, whereas if they go into the office and they're sitting on, a, a, on the fourth floor of your office building, they may have more security rights in terms of what they can do with that corporate resource, but also things like uh, network printers that are on that floor, file shares that are relevant to that location could all be dynamically applied to that desktop. So if you have some type of policy configuration that takes into account context in this Windows environment, you're able to deliver a much more dynamic experience that can easily incorporate the need to use new devices like iPads. The um, iPad uh, and, and tablet invasion is really driving increased interest in, in server-based computing, whether it's uh, Citrix. Uh, Citrix has some very nice iPad and, and iPhone clients, as well as and now expanding into to other areas like Android devices. So it's a great option for being able to, without having to get in the business of managing iPads, be able to provide convenience and productivity access to your corporate resources. Um, and there are a lot of things that you can do um, you know, through this, this decoupling of the user and being able to dynamically adapt the environment that's going to allow you to, to kind of meet your users halfway, even if they're using a personal device like, like an iPad, um, and make sure that you're drawing a line between giving them convenience, but also making sure that you're not going to be generating additional help desk calls, you're not going to be exposing your organization to security risks as a result of having this new way of, of computing within your environment. The next um, uh, item I'll talk about, most, most of what I've talked about so far pertains to the operating system, but as I mentioned very early on in those four key areas of focus, applications are really a big part of the Windows 7 migration. It's, it's arguably the most challenging part, is figuring out exactly which applications people are using and figuring out the best way to get them deployed on Windows 7. And what we're seeing with our customer base is that many organizations in Windows XP world have uh, largely locally installed or MSI-based applications that they're using. And as they move to Windows 7, they see an opportunity to streamline their application deployment techniques. Often this will include maybe expanding their use of terminal services or things like Citrix Zen App uh, to deliver applications um, over the network. Um, in other cases, they are looking at things like Microsoft App V or other application virtualization technologies. So while these oftentimes are different projects from Windows 7, they kind of go part and parcel, and it's worth considering much in the same way that you might consider desktop virtualization. It could be that you decide to incorporate these things into your migration project to simplify it and get yourself to a better place, or even if you're not planning to use those technologies day one, having the ability to have a user roam between a locally installed instance of, say, Excel to one delivered via Citrix, perhaps down to an iPad, perhaps to a regular PC, or, or then from there move over to, to um, AppV, you know, either enabling that on an ongoing basis or simply doing a one-time migration of the user from a locally installed application to a virtualized equivalent as they move to Windows 7 is a key part of the migration project. And it's an area where you know, at AppSense, through some of the, the capabilities we've been able to provide around uh, dynamically delivering user personalization, that applies both to applications, including multi-OS, and multi-application uh, method of, of um, environments to, to make that a whole lot easier. So, um, you know, what you what you may want to think about is perhaps having a hierarchy. You know, what is your your plan A in terms of the best way to deploy an application in Windows Seven? Um, maybe that you know, for the sake of the example, maybe that Zen App is your, is your preferred approach. Um, as you find applications that don't lend themselves to Zen App, maybe you fall back to App V. And then maybe if the, neither of those is an option, you still rely on, on locally installed applications. And even if you have a mix of these things, you can have users um, you know, personalize these applications and have those personalization um, attributes apply even if they're moving across different application deployment methods. Um, and then by the same token, if you have users that are making heavier use of Citrix environments, for example, application licensing is, is another key consideration where if you had a more expensive application, like say Microsoft Project that not every user needs, um, you, you may want to put some granular controls in place around which users can launch that application. And uh, we've been able to work with some customers to do, do exactly that and do it in a way where Microsoft actually will um, sign off on the fact that through the controls we've been able to work with them to put in place, they do not have to pay for licenses to the theoretical users of that application. Instead, they can limit it to only those that have explicit access to that application, even if it's running on a shared environment that's accessible by many users. So um, secret number six is thinking about user rights. So often in Windows XP environments that we see, 
there is a very wide scale instance of users who have full administrative rights to their desktop. And in the IT space, I think we all know that this is kind of a nightmare in that users, uh, to the extent that they have admin rights, they may have gotten those admin rights to do a very specific thing, but in turn, they go and do a whole bunch of other things that destabilize the desktop, potentially introduce security exposures. Um, at the same time, most IT shops don't have the luxury of removing those admin rights because there are practical reasons why the users need them. Um, since Windows XP has come out, there, there's been a lot of advances around user rights management, and um, this is another area where we've been doing quite a bit of work with, with some of our customers, is giving them the ability to more granularly control user rights beyond what you get out of the box with Windows, even with Windows 7. So for example, um, if you're moving from Windows XP to, to Windows 7, you know there are certain things that users have a practical need to be able to administer, like um, you know time zone changes or, or being able to um, install certain types of um, you know web-based software like Adobe Reader, uh, or maybe um, things like uh, you know accessing and, and, and configuring the wireless adapter on that particular PC. All of those are very legitimate things that a user would need to self-administer. Um, what we allow you to do is move them over to, to Windows 7 in a way where you can dial back their admin rights. But at the same time, if there are practical needs like this, you can selectively elevate just the things that they need to do in order to be productive. And where you'll likely end up is a place where you know everyone's a little unhappy. IT obviously would rather just have everything completely locked down, and users would rather have free reign. But where you could end up is kind of in the middle, where um, users have just the rights they need to be productive and no more, to the point where the, the IT help desk calls will go down, the security exposure will go down. So it's, it's definitely something to think about as you're embarking on your Windows 7 migration. Rather than just giving everybody the same level of rights they have today, there may be an opportunity to, to improve things for, for the better in, in your IT environment. And um, ultimately, I think what it comes down to is just the level of management that you have over your, your PC. I'm going to come back to this in a bit more uh, in a moment, but Gartner actually publishes some interesting data around the total cost of ownership of a desktop. And that by their, their estimations, this will change very dramatically based on how locked down the desktop is. If you've got a, a what they call a well-managed PC, um, you're, you're really looking at thousands of dollars less per PC per, per year in terms of the cost of managing that, that desktop environment. The challenge is IT today doesn't have the luxury of locking everything down, so they never really realize those costs. So through some of the techniques I've described, you can you know, move away from this black and white rule and instead get to one that's kind of shades of gray and, and also be able to respond to legitimate needs quickly without having to immediately just hand over the keys to the, to the castle, so to speak. And then finally, um, you know, number seven, I think you know, I touched on this a bit earlier already, but the idea of you know, software asset management, thinking about um, the, the way that you're delivering applications and, and potentially you know, being able to be more dynamic in that. So rather than having to build a bunch of applications into your base image that all users don't need, using some of these techniques like, like uh, Citrix or, or AppV to layer applications on top of the OS, but also the notion I just described around being able to control which, by policy, which applications a user can launch. So even if an application is installed into the OS, you can document the fact that that user is by policy prevented from, from launching that application. Um, a technique like this, along with, with things like user rights management, can really go a long way, again, towards simplifying your management posture and, and, and have a direct cost impact in terms of reducing your exposure for application licensing. I mean, it's very expensive, and oftentimes it's, it's necessary, but nothing's worse than paying for licenses that you know nobody is using, but you just don't have the luxury of controlling it. And that's, that's definitely an area of opportunity as you're looking at your applications and how you deploy them. Um, what are some policies that you can put in place and what are some tools you can use to, to make that all happen? So where does this kind of all come together? You know, all of these are, are, I think, good practices that are, that are worth your consideration. But ultimately what it comes down to is this notion of improving the, the number of best practices you have in place and by extension reducing your total cost of ownership. So these are, this is kind of a more extensive definition of what I described a moment ago around Gartner's classifications on, on total cost of ownership. And ultimately what you want to get to is this idea of a, of a locked and well-managed desktop, which as, I, as I've mentioned is not really a reality or, or a possibility uh, today, uh, but it could be with Windows 7 through some of these more granular controls that are now available to you. And what we've seen, we kind of took some of the data uh, that Gartner had in these, in these kind of first four bars that show you kind of the progression of um, of reduction in, in cost as you move down. 
um, we've been able to help organizations get to that well-managed state without the impractical need to just completely lock everything down. But then beyond that, by decoupling the user layer from the OS, we've been able to even take that, that migration cost down further. So this is actually Gartner's uh, whereas, versus the other, the other numbers I was showing were more kind of annual total cost of ownership. These are one-time uh, migration costs of getting a particular user from XP to Windows 7. So you, as you can see here, um, by, by employing a combination of these techniques, you can literally shave $1,000 per device off of, uh, or, or desktop off of the cost of moving a user to Windows 7. Um, and this is, this is kind of one sample scenario, so obviously you know, mileage will vary, but at the end of the day, there is a, a real tangible um, cost savings that comes with deploying some of these best practices. So with that, um, you know, th that, that's kind of the prepared content that, that um, we've, we have for today, but um, hopefully it's kind of provoked some, some thoughts and questions on your part, so um, definitely invite you to, to ask any questions if you haven't already, and we'll, we'll take a, a, a moment here to, to answer some of those. Great, thanks Doug. So uh, we do have um, a couple coming in. Um, there's a, a question from Charlie, can this completely replace profiles? Uh, correct. So something like, like um, user virtualization as we do at AppSense, exactly. It's, it's effectively, if you're using uh, techniques like roaming profiles and things like that in the past, this is an alternative way of doing that. So instead of using that technique, you just have a very slimmed down um, uh, profile on the OS itself, and then we have software running in the desktop that will deliver this, this personalization information on, on demand as a replacement for that traditional um, roaming profile. Um, okay, great. So uh, another question. Um, so moving uh, VDIs with per Persona, does AppSense store personal information on a centralized database? That's correct. Yes. Yeah. So the way that the way that our software works is that we have a, a centralized um, database that's based on SQL Server, and we have software running within the desktop environments, whether it's a native OS or a desktop or a virtual desktop OS. And as changes are being made to the OS and applications. The software we have running in the desktop is capturing those whenever somebody closes an application. And so it's not all happening at log off time and, and potentially increasing log on and log off time. It's kind of as things are happening, the software in the, in the desktop OS is capturing those changes, streaming them back to a database. And then when the user next accesses another desktop, they log in. And you know, like an example I provided earlier, it could be even a, a non-persistent virtual desktop. But what happens is we stream um, that personalization just in time. So the personalization they need to get started is immediately available, and then as they, for example, click on the Microsoft Word icon and launch Word, we're streaming down in real time Word-related personalization to that environment. So it's um, it's storing it all in a centralized database, but it's delivering it on demand to the local desktop. And that local desktop software also has caching capabilities. So if you're using a laptop, even though the, the canonical version of that data lives in a database, it can be cached locally and, and work offline, and then they'll resync next time you connect. Uh, to the corporate network. Okay, great. Thanks, Doug. So uh, another question here uh, from Mark Freeman. How does AppSense compare to Citrix RingCube? Uh, sure. So RingCube is, um, um, you know, starting to, to breach into similar areas. I think that the primary difference is that RingCube can help you with things like this non-persistent, you know, so if you're deploying Citrix Zen Desktop, and you, your goal is to layer a persona, persona layer on top of that non-persistent desktop. That's in effect what what RingCube is designed to do. And um, I think we, you know, it's still a relatively new product to Citrix, so we're still, you know, seeing how that's going to play out. Um, but certainly, you know, seems seems like a reasonable approach if your if your sole concern is delivering a non-persistent um, Zen desktop session with a personalized experience. RingCube is is, is definitely in your consideration set. Um, where what we do is a little bit beyond that is that we are doing that same thing beyond Zen Desktop. So we can we can do that with Zen Desktop. We can also do it with Citrix Zen App. Um, we can do it with a native PC um, that's not even virtualized. We can do it with um, um, you know VMware, any number of other deployment methods. So um, you know that's that's a key area of difference is that we're kind of a cross-platform uh, model that also includes native PCs. And then, and also includes the full Citrix suite if you if you have Z app running as well. And then this the same kind of just in time notion that I just talked about is also kind of a key difference point where if you do you know the, the RingCube solution is kind of one big virtual disk that they're streaming down to you over the network, whereas our solution is a, a bit more kind of just in time uh, delivery type approach that um, 
you know, can, can really have an impact in terms of the experience of, of logons and log offs and things like that. So, um, you know, some other differences as well, but I think those are, those are the key ones to, to think about. Okay, great. And uh, look, uh, we got one more question here. Just a reminder, folks, go ahead. Um, got a couple more minutes. If uh, you have any questions, just submit them through the chat feature there. Uh, if we don't get to it or you think of a, a question just after, um, of course, you can go ahead and uh, schedule a uh, follow-up phone discussion or in-person meeting with uh, IPM or Absence with that uh, scheduling feature on the right there. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we did get a, uh, one more question in here. Um, does Absence require agents? If so, how big is it? Um, so yeah, we do we do require agents um, that are that are installed into the the OS itself. Um, so that's the software I was talking about that does the the communication back to the the server and the database and the kind of capture of personalization. I, you know, those could be described as agents. Um, I don't actually have um, off the top of my head the size of those, so it's something that I can certainly follow up with uh, the person asked the question and and answer. Um, so I, I apologize, I don't know it off the top of my head. <clears throat> Great. Okay. So, and then uh, Manny asks, "How does this technology work with laptop users or someone who is offline?" Right. So, so yeah, someone who is is working offline would um, effectively the Absence um, agent software would be installed. They could have a, a a laptop running native Windows. Our software would be installed into that that OS and would be running as they as they use Windows. And then effectively, if they're connected to the corporate network when they're making personalizations to the OS and the applications, our agent will send that back um, real, kind of real time and, and also bring things down real time. If they're taking that laptop offline, that's where the caching capabilities come into play. So anything that they have personalized in the past as of the last time that they had um, been connected to the server would be there. They can continue to make changes. So if they're on the road disconnected, they can continue to personalize the OS and the applications, and all of those will be captured and kind of cached and then the next time that laptop connects back to the Absence uh, backend infrastructure, those changes will be pushed back up to the server. So um, it, it's, it's useful even if they just have that one laptop, but then where it becomes very handy is if they have a laptop that they use 90% of the time, but then 10% you know, of the time they need to log in from a home PC or from an iPad and access those same applications through Citrix or something else, then all of those personalizations they made on the native laptop are going to show up even if they're using Citrix or something else to access it on a different day. Okay, um, great. Thanks, Doug. So it looks like that might be our, our last question. Um, uh, again, folks, if you have anything else or if you um, think of anything later, please feel free to reach out via that um, uh, appointment scheduling feature and we'll be happy to, to regroup. Um, Doug, I'd like to thank you personally and, and of course, uh, as um, Shannon said at the beginning, thanks to everybody who's been on for all, all six. Uh, this was a great way to end it. Some really good information. Um, on the migration and, and uh, those top seven tips. Also, it, the, the presentation um, that you went through, Doug, that'll be online for everybody at ipmconsiderandone.com here in the next day or so. So um, uh, you can come, come back and, and watch or share with, share with your colleagues um, at that URL as well. I don't know, Shannon, if you want to say thanks. Yep, just thank you to everyone that has been involved in all six of these. We really hope that you found this of value and look forward to speaking with more of you in further detail about the topics that were covered and, and helping plan for the coming year. So thank you very much. Doug, thank you. And we look forward to talking to all of you soon. Great. Thanks, Doug. Great. Thank you.